16 minutes past one. Welcome to the Executive Lounge and your dial is on 99.7 FM. We're also around the world at myjoyonline.com and uh, on Facebook. Hi, if you're watching us on Facebook Live, it's the Joy 99.7 FM uh, Facebook page. And you can tweet at me at GH Rainmaker. Hashtag the Executive Lounge. Today, we're going to jump into a very interesting conversation about career development. I mean, the question I recently asked myself is why should anyone bother building a career? Especially when the World Economic Forum predicts that in the next 15 years, most of the jobs that we do today will no longer exist. Yeah. That's very disturbing, huh? But apparently there's a silver lining. And so you don't have to turn your back on developing yourself and your career. My guest today is a writer, a digital strategist, a policy consultant, trained as an economist, and claims all by herself in her own capacity as a wordsmith. Jamila Abdullahi is my guest this afternoon, and you are welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you, Inshira. So, nice to catch up with you. We've been trying to have this conversation for probably the best part of three years. <laughs> You're a very busy woman, uh, but it's good to catch you. And I did promise our audience that because we lost a, f uh, a few weeks to the Ayawa, so uh, West Wogon hearing, um, I was going to make up because I was going to dedicate the entire month of March to... Um, plundering the brains of, uh, or the fine brains of uh, females in celebration of uh, Women's Month. Um, but I think we're going to try and extend it and even do only females in the month of uh, April as well. That's great. Yeah, I think we should do that. So, you're welcome and uh, good to have you on the Executive Lounge. Thank you and good afternoon to your listeners. Yes, I'm sure they're very excited and they're also saying their good afternoons. But before we go into this um, all important conversation. You run uh, circumspect.com. Um, you trained as an economist. You're a policy analyst, uh, consultant. You're a digital strategist. You write. I mean, you wear like a million and one hat. Where did you learn to do all of these? Um, I think I started pretty young. I was hyperactive as a child. Ah, like me. Yes. Couldn't sit still. <laughs> a psychologist diagnosed hyperactive. So okay. I had a lot of energy and I was also very curious. Mm. So my, my dad used to, he nicknamed me TK, which was short for two known because I'm like <laughs> always in everybody's business trying to understand. And I used to spend a lot of time with adults. Mm -hmm. Like I liked having conversations with people way older, older than, than me. Than me. Um, wow. So I think that's kind of where it started. Just that curiosity to understand things, to try to see why things are the way they are. And that curiosity is actually what led me to doing economics mm. because I wanted to understand, like, why do we price things the way we price them? Mm -hmm. Or why, um, why do we have certain goods on the market and not other ones? Of course, I didn't understand it like that then. Uh, but when I was going to um, Wesley Girls High School, I chose general arts and I focused on economics. And one of my teachers, uh, Mr. Edu Taylor, bless his heart, um, he really made a difference for me because he made economics fun. Right. He made it very fun. And that appealed to the analyst in me to be able to think not just based on appearances, but what's happening behind the scenes leading to what you're seeing on the surface. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I got into economics. Um, I started using computers at four years old, so which was very early for my generation, mainly because my father um, is a computer scientist, and both he and my mom are teachers by you know by nature they're mm -hmm. teachers and they work in the education space and so at home, we always had books, 
we always had, there was always a computer as far as I could remember. Yeah. And my dad would sometimes allow me to play with it, right? And this was when he had the old Macintosh Apple computers. This was Whoa. in Norway and he used to let me use his student computer. So I had a very early affinity to technology. And um, as someone who's a people person, I think I geared more towards the networking um, elements and also eventually the social networking elements of, of, of um, technology. Interesting stuff. So early exposure to technology, just basically being in everybody's business, <laughs> uh, curious about curiosity, um, led you down a path of um, getting to... Uh, know more about the world and 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 just build on this curiosity. So you find yourself wearing many hats now, which is a cool thing. Um, but your work, you know, you you've worked across about ten different countries. Yeah. Um, do you find that for someone who's curious, you s were able to fit into these spaces well and easily? I mean, I think um, when it comes to traveling, I think everybody has their cycles or their rhythms. Um, so I definitely dealt with um, some of the elements of trying to fit in or find your place. Uh, even when um, living in African countries. So I lived in Senegal for a little over a year. I lived in Ivory Coast, Tunisia. Um, and with each of these countries, I definitely went through a period of acclimatation. Um, but I think if you are somebody who is curious and who is especially interested in learning about the world or learning about other people and their cultures, uh, you actually find that process to be an empowering process. Mm -hmm. I mean, not to say it's not painful. Of course, you deal with homesickness. So mm -hmm. I spent the five years away from Ghana studying um, in the U.S. and I never saw my family until after those five years. Wow. Yes. And, and you guys are pretty tight too. Yeah. <laughs> so oh. so you, you kind of learn to be, I think as the firstborn, I, have, I do have an independent streak. I've always had that as a child. Mm -hmm. And even going away to boarding school, um, I, I told my parents, you know, you don't need to come all the way from Accra to Cape Coast every two weeks. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. So I could go like months without seeing them and I would be fine, right? So I think all of that built towards that. But um, it's, there is a lot in our world and especially on the African continent that are very similar and also distinct differences where we can learn from each other. And for me, that's usually what draws me to a new place to find out um, how similar it might be to other places I've been and how different and unique it is and what, what I can learn from it in that sense. Is it always um, easy to, to be curious and travel across the world and this continent as a woman? Definitely not. Um, I think when you're traveling as a, when you're a solo traveler, meaning you're traveling alone, and especially if you're a solo woman traveler, you have to take certain precautions. So you need to be aware of like what neighborhoods you're, you're staying at. You need to at least have somebody on the ground who you can contact. Uh, usually if it's for business purposes, then that would be like the client or a partner. Mm -hmm. But if you're just traveling for leisure, it's useful to connect with people. And this is where the internet has been very useful for me. Um, and also just having been to many different places, I, I cannot count the number of people I know but I have a pretty extensive network. And so even if I don't know somebody in a country, I know someone who will know somebody in a country. Mm -hmm. So I like to um, ask if there's anybody in a specific city uh, before I get to the city. And that way I'm able to have a point of connection. It's also a good way to learn about a place through the eyes of a local. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where platforms like Airbnb come in handy. If you end up staying with a family, then you get to actually see what life is for that family as opposed to just going to all the tourist spots. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's interesting stuff. Uh, maybe I should try it one day. <laughs> so let's let's now jump into um, the career development, yes. um, especially in this digital age. And I like the fact that you know you've leveraged technology uh, from a very early age. Um, bless your mom and dad. Yes. Um, Thank you, Daddy you know, and mommy. <laughs> that you have um, 
access to computers. There's some who don't, but yeah. whether we like it or not, the digital age is here with us. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the tools, looking back at your own, I mean, of course, knowing you were curious, um, the, if you look back at the journey, uh, how would you distill what you would say could be some steps or key milestones that people need to work towards yeah. to be prepared for any sort of career uh, that they want to in the digital age? Okay, so I actually think the the essentials or the things that you need in order to navigate career development in this age are actually not necessarily technologically linked. Um, the first thing I would say is curiosity. Okay. Right. I think you definitely have to be someone who wants to learn and who has a spirit that's open to learning. Right. And if you have that, then that's where you're going to find yourself getting into spaces where you can learn as much as possible. Uh, so in, in junior high school, I went to Alsat Academy. And whenever they would give us class projects, uh, I wouldn't only do the projects based off of my class notes. My parents had an, an encyclopedia because teachers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would actually open up the encyclopedia to find out more about whatever topic it was and then use that information and put it into my my research project, report. Yeah. Um, eventually, when I really started using computers, uh, I would go with my father on the weekends to his office and claim to be doing research, mm -hmm. right? That was my thing. I'm like, I'm going to do research. I don't even know what I was researching, <laughs> but it was just being in that space, right? And those were also opportunities to do research and find out different things. And so very quickly, I, I found myself, this was in 97 to 2000, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. I found myself in Yahoo chat rooms. Wow. Yes, so I was a teenager. <laughs> sitting in Yahoo chat rooms, um, basically playing counselor to people all over the world, even though I hadn't like been through, I'm sure, a lot of the things that they had been through at that point in their age. But that was because at that time, I thought I wanted to be a psychologist. Okay. And so that was like practice for me to go and have conversations with people, try to understand them, and then try to give them advice. So that's kind of where it started for me. So curiosity is definitely a big one. Mm -hmm. um, another one is you need to be willing to find out the things that don't necessarily come easily or readily to you. And I think this is very important in the context of Ghana's education mm -hmm. system where in many respects it's lacking, right? So you might get a solid education on a very specific industry, um, or very specific skill, mm -hmm. but you might be missing on some of the soft skill elements. And what do they mean by soft skill elements? Things like how to present yourself, mm. um, public speaking, how to do business writing, those, those elements. And that kind of information, you can definitely use the internet to, to get. And there are many resources all over the world that you can tap into. But I, uh, I find that whenever I would use some of those resources, the question that I always came back to was, how does this apply to me? Mm -hmm. Because I never actually saw myself in, let's say, the images or the videos, because mm -hmm. they don't look like us for the most part. They're not necessarily African or Ghanaian. Um, and, and so that became a burning passion for me to be able to... Uh, try to be resourceful, not just for myself, but for other people who might need that kind of information. And so with my platform, circumspect.com, we have a lot of career resources specifically for that reason, because there's not enough career resources fine-tuned to Ghanaian youth yeah. or professionals or African youth and professionals. And we want to be able to provide that in the context of the countries that we come from. Uh, in university, my very first job, well, my first job was washing pans at 6 a.m. in the morning before class, right? So 6 to 7 a.m., I would wake up, it's cold outside, go downstairs and wash pants. Okay. That was the job. And my second job was working at the career development center of my university. And while I was there, they used to organize resume workshops. They used to organize cover letter workshops, mock interviews, teaching you how to present yourself, how to find your voice. And being, again, finding myself in a space of learning, I absorbed that information. And 
the dream that I had, even in my um, college applications, I always said, I want to open up a career development center. And it's still a big part of the dream. Uh, it's just we're taking little bites of it with circumspect mm -hmm. and, and other initiatives. So I think finding yourself in the right spaces. Mm -hmm. um, that said, if you do not have access to the internet, because that is a reality for many of us, um, you should try to craft your own opportunities. If, for example, you are looking for um, a job in a very specific sector, and in Ghana, that sector is very small or there aren't enough companies offering opportunities, think about starting a project of your own that is focused on that. It could be a volunteer project. It could be a hobby. But when you start doing that, what ends up happening is over time, you're going to have to learn how to do more of that. And in the process, you gain the skills that you need. Mm. And as you gain the skills that you need, you can then leverage that to apply for the job down the line. Okay. So I think a lot of us um, sit down to be handed opportunities or, or a lot of us, and, and I should actually just say this now, I think a lot of young Ghanaians today, um, the ones who at least I've come across, uh, there are two types. One is very proactive meaning they will chase you down and say, this is what we're trying to do. Can I have an opportunity with you? Can you give me information on this? And then you have the other type, which unfortunately tends to be the majority, that just feels self-entitled. Mm. So they will reach out to you with a question, but the tone of the message already tells you that this is someone who thinks they are owed. And as young people, I think apart from the government, which I believe they do owe us um, certain things, being the government um, and maybe our parents. Nobody else Who owes owe us. owe you to an extent? To an extent, of <laughs> course. Not in totality, yeah. right? Um, but nobody else really owes us anything. Mm. And I think, I believe that for each of us, the journey of life is precisely about sculpting yourself and sculpting your life. And these are elements of Islam, for example. Mm -hmm. In Islam, they say, um, follow knowledge or search, seek knowledge, even if it takes you all the way to China. Mm. So knowledge is at the bedrock of Islam, which is um, what I believe in. And so that quest for always trying to understand the world mm. and learning not just about the world, but yourself, your community and giving back mm. is a big part of um, what I've grown up with. Wow, that's very interesting. And uh, uh, thank you. Uh, if you just tuned in, you're listening to Joy 99.7 FM. I'm Ishira Addo. My guest is Jamila Abdullahi. And this is the Executive Lounge. And we're uh, looking at um, career development in the uh, digital age. Uh, Jamila has uh, shared her own experiences about how, um, for her, curiosity uh, was, was the foundation on which uh, she's developed um, her mind, uh, exposure, and also you should develop things that are not, you know, your skills around things that are not readily available to you. Um, there may be uh, things that, you know, you're not taught uh, or things that are not uh, within your reach, but uh, the world is getting smaller every day, so you should be able to get things out there. And more importantly, that you should craft your own opportunities. Give yourself a chance. Uh, get out there and leverage a relationship or a tool someone else has to build uh, that skill that you're looking for. And it's quite interesting, Jamila, that um, you did say, oh, yeah, by the way, you can uh, send us your thoughts in 0244 340437 uh, if you have um, some thoughts you want us to, um, or questions for my guest, uh, Jamila. But, you know, you focused on soft skills. Yeah. Why is that so important in the digital age? So I think what ended up happening is um, at a period in time, the focus was on technical and hard skills. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to an extent for certain countries, Ghana included, it's still a big priority. Uh, but because you're seeing the emergence of artificial intelligence, especially with computers and technology, a lot of those hard skills like doing math complex math can be done by computers mm. uh, so what the research is showing now is that you're actually going to see a flip of what is needed in order to excel in the workforce and it's leaning more towards soft skills and leaning more towards um, I would say the arts so things like philosophy psychology mm. um, conflict management 
basically all the elements that the computers will not as yet be able to do, the human elements are going to become increasingly more important. And so if you have the technical skills, but you do not know how to, for example, work in a team, or you do not know how to represent your organization, or you do not know how to um, resolve conflicts mm -hmm. with colleagues or, or co-workers, then that becomes a problem. Uh, there was a recent McKinsey study, I think it's been a few years, uh, and they were looking at uh, talking to a number of companies across Africa to find out about the youth unemployment situation and why they're not hiring African youth. And the big reason was because they didn't have the right work culture fit, which goes back to soft skills. Mm. And so without having the soft skills, uh, even if you have all of the technical elements uh, and you might be the best person in your field, if you're not able to work with other human beings, then that becomes a problem. Unless, of course, you're in a role that doesn't require you to work with human beings per se. Maybe you're in a role which is more um, insular or solo, focusing more on machinery and so on. But even in those cases, you still have to do a bit of working with colleagues and so on. And so that's why soft skills are becoming very important and will continue to be. Uh, and un unfortunately, if you look at the economic elements, a lot of the jobs that these machines are going to take over or the computers are going to be able to do are going to be jobs that um, low-income communities do. And this is true both in the United States, for example, as it is in Ghana, right? If we're able to mechanize agriculture, then it means that the farmers, both men and women, are going to be out of jobs, and then what happens, right? So that th those are big questions that the development community and human development communities are grappling with, and then it all comes back down to education. How are we equipping today or tomorrow's generation to be able to not only contribute to society, but make real livelihoods? Mm. So having been through the education system mm -hmm. yourself, yeah. um, if you look back with all of these, you know, imminent changes, what would you do differently if you had the free reign, the free reign to just, uh, <laughs> to, you know, direct us in the, in the path we should go? I think, ah, man, that's like one of my favorite questions. Um, I think Good. I, now would I can rest for the rest <laughs> of the afternoon and then you just talk. <laughs> I think I would focus a bit on principles. Mm. Right. Um, one question I always ask myself and I ask friends is, what does it mean to be a Ghanaian? Right. And maybe a few years ago, at the heights of Black Star's glory, we would have easily said the Black Stars. Like, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a clear identity for being a Ghanaian, mm -hmm. right? But today, can we say the same thing? And if not the Black Stars, then what? And for me, those are the questions that ultimately will not only guide our education and our future, but will guide the very course of our nation. And um, if you look at countries like South Korea, for example, so or Malaysia, I think Malaysia might be a better example to you. So Malaysia and, and Ghana gained independence within the same year. And this is an example we keep coming back to. And it's we sad. do that all the time. It's sad that we have to keep coming yeah. back to it. But one of the things that they did was they identified for themselves what their goals were as a nation. We've been talking about Vision 2020. It's next year. Yeah. Do we uh, even know we, what it's didn't about? Didn't we bring it back to... I mean, I do remember bits of Vision 2020 when it was launched. Yeah. Um, but then again, you know... It, I think inherent in that story mm -hmm. is the lack of follow through. Yes. Um, but but as you were saying, that Malaysia had a clear idea what they wanted. Okay, yeah. what they wanted to do. Um, how will you? You said principles, mm -hmm. um, identity. But we're a multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic. Um, Country. Society, yeah. yeah. Do you think that's possible? Yeah, I, def I definitely think that's possible because I think um, in school, for example, 
that's probably the first introduction that any Ghanaian child has to this notion of Ghanaianness. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to define Ghanaianness as being a diverse people, then that should reflect in our educational system. Right. Right. And we should be able to see that, yes, we all come from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. econo economic situations, and so on. But at the end of the day, these are the principles that we all believe in or are gathering around. And mm -hmm. I think that's where you see the differences between countries that seem to have a very clear identity. Case in point, the U.S. before their recent identity crisis, mm -hmm. right? Um, where if you ask an American what it means to be American, you'll probably hear the same things coming from different people, the same words. Freedom will definitely be in there somewhere. Right. And so that's what I mean by principles and talking about those elements. Beyond that, it's also looking at um, local content. So if you take Ghana's um, history books, mm -hmm. why does it start with colonization? Did we have a history before colonization? And if we did, what was that history? And that's the way that you shape this identity process, but also you you instill a certain sense of confidence in in who you are. That we were once kings. I mean, and we st I think we still are. It's just that maybe it's not as evident as before. But mm -hmm. I do believe that um, it doesn't mean that we've lost that. It's just a question of refinding that and owning that. Mm -hmm. uh, and also for many of us, I know that I never actually thought about my Ghanaianness or my Africanness as much until I left Ghana. And so for many of us who do have the opportunity to leave Ghana, that's when you're faced with this question of what does it mean to be a Ghanaian and what am I willing to sacrifice for Ghana? And that's another question to ask. Would you willingly die for your country? That's kind of hard. And if not, why? Mm. And if we can figure out that why and start working towards addressing that why, many people will say, because my, my country doesn't give me anything. In which case, the next question is, so what do you want your country to give you? And then we can start saying, okay, priorities-wise, mm -hmm. people want education. People want electricity or X, Y, Z, right? So I think a lot of it is, is the intangibles. We focus a lot on road to learning, but I don't know if we leave enough room for creativity, for imagination, mm -hmm for real dialogue and conversation. And if young people and children are given the opportunity to be more creative and not feel like they have to be boxed in right from the jump, I mean, I can only imagine what will happen. It's quite interesting you said, you know, we kind of place people in boxes and then when they're used to staying in boxes, we start telling them to think outside of the box. Yeah. Um, the Japanese don't do any examination till after age four um, and and one of the things that they're taught is what makes Japan a wonderful place and, and a wonderful people and we all remember in 2014 at the World Cup when the Japanese fans actually cleaned up um, yep. you know the, the section of the stand and I think the team also cleaned their their dressing room mm -hmm. um, after their last game um, well I think it's something they did uh, throughout but these are things that are ingrained in the children by the time they are four yeah that's because there's a plan so it goes back to the same business of a vision yeah. um i'm now quickly mentally scanning through the seven-year development plan under Kwame Nkrumah. i think it was more a development plan i don't think it necessarily addressed the issue of our identity yeah. uh and so Will we, in your estimation, ever get it right? Because at the moment, I can't answer the questions you asked. Yeah. What makes it, what, what is Ghana? What, what makes us Ghanaian? I mean, I think we, we do have the opportunity to explore that. And in order for us to really explore that, I do think it has to come from two elements at the high level, at the highest level, actually. Mm -hmm. Those questions should be and it should be open. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't come with preconceived ideas about who a Ghanaian is. It should be open, take stock of it. But also from the community level, communities need to be able to define for themselves who they are. I'll give you an example from Rwanda. Um, so we know about the Rwandan genocide and you know how devastating it was for yeah. this country. But in a very short period of time, Rwanda has 
from what we can see, made a big turnaround. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I visited a few years ago, and um, I was having conversations with a lot of the locals and some of my friends there. And they talked to me about this concept, which is called, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well, uh, Ingushiru, which basically is a concept of having dignity. So after the genocide, and mind you, this was a genocide where you had two main ethnic groups at each other's yeah. throats, right? And so you already had divisions within this country. What they decided to focus on was restoring their dignity. And that permeates every single thing they do, mm. right? So when they had the problems, as opposed to going through the court system um, to try to figure out who was responsible for what, they couldn't mm -hmm. because they quickly realized that everybody was involved in one way or the other. So what they did instead was they reverted to their traditional court systems where they just had um, community set up. So the entire community would come together and each one would talk about the role they played in, in the genocide or how they felt they were wronged. So if person A says, I did X, Y, and Z, the next question is, why did you do that? And the person might say, because B told me this. And so it goes round. And then that way they realized that they were all involved mm. in some way, shape or form. And instead of putting um, the people who were perpetrators in prison, I think they did to a point, but they quickly realized that wasn't sustainable because they didn't have enough prisons. They might, have, uh, they might as well end up j just jailing a half of that exactly. population. So what they did, um, and just to give some context, dur during the genocide, I think it was just Ga Ghana and a few African countries that had like peacekeepers go well, there. Well, the Ghanaian contingent at yeah. the time uh, refused to leave at the height of yes. the... Of the, of the um, the you genocide. Know, yeah, yeah, I think it was uh, General Anidoho who was leading exactly. them at the yes. time. Yeah. So you had the bulk of the international community turning away from them they had no aid coming in what's the next question how do we eat so what they did was once they figure out this is how you were involved in this situation they will say okay you and your in quotes enemy this is a plot of land go and farm it wow that's what they did didn't and people end up burying uh, people no. in into the ground no they and they ended so up so they healed they that healed by bringing the protagonists together and say work together exactly that's and that's what they did and make something beautiful happen that's what they did mm. and so they ended up rebuilding precisely because of that but more importantly because their focus was on dignity this time they actually had the power to determine how people outsiders interact with their country mm -hmm. so if you are going to keep Gali and you take Rwanda Air, they have their development plan in the airplane. Wow. And they identify for you, these are the sectors we need investment in. If there's any other sector, we're not interested for now. These are the sectors we need investment in. So this is an example of how they took something which was a vision from the high level, but they also made it very localized. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, for me, that's, that's an example of what we could do if we are committed the okay. other thing is if we are actually committed and our purpose is actually to build our country and not necessarily to just have individual gains. Mm. But there's the question of the um, the demographic dividend. Yeah. I mean, w population is going to go like through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, jobs that are low level, low skilled jobs are likely to go away. So we're going to have on our hands lots of young people yeah. um, that need new skills. Um, you've said that one of the quickest ways to bridge that gap would be that people have to develop um, soft skills. Um, but this must be situated within the exactly. context of an identity and, and the country going somewhere and a yeah. plan. Um, you've talked about how we should educate that you know so let's focus on principles mm -hmm. uh, one um and the second one was um principles diversity yeah diversity that we're all very different and, and that should be taught content. at a very and local content fantastic so these three things would give us a sense of who we are and the confidence we require how will that distinguish us from another developing country and give us the kind of leapfrogging we're dreaming about. 
So personally, I think we're too focused on appearances. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I think what ends up happening is that we do things, but we do it to see how people will perceive us mm. as opposed to just doing them. And there's no, I mean, there's no um, guarantee that this will pan out the way we want it to pan out. But I think the doing is in the process. And we live right now, we tend to live a lot on, on um, past glories, right? Mm -hmm. So we like to say that we are the first sub-Saharan African countries again. And like, honestly, I get tired of saying that, right? Because then the question is, so what do we have to offer now? And you do have some things happening, right? So, um, for, for example, just recently was announced that two Ghanaian companies won the Skoll Forums That's Awards. That's right, yes. Right? That's an example of local ingenuity, which is going not just continental, but global. global. I don't know that when they set out, they were like, oh, we want to be there. X, Y, Z. Well, or they were just saying, this is the situation and we're trying to solve this problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so I mm -hmm. think a lot of the times we might, and it's a balancing act, even as an entrepreneur, you have to have a vision, but you also must not get blinded by that vision such that you're not dealing with the day-to-day -day realities, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it's a balancing act that we will have to figure. I don't mm -hmm. have any answers on that. It's something that I hope through the process we will be able to figure out. And I wanted to just circle back a bit because mm -hmm. I think a big part of it is also about self-knowledge on an individual level. So um, with Circumspect, like, like yourselves, we're also focusing on women. We've been focusing on women's issues the entire month of, of March. And um, we're culminating in an event on Saturday, mm -hmm. which is called Sisterhood Matters. And a big reason for this event, there are two main reasons. Number one is the fact that a lot of Ghanaian and African women do not actually have the opportunity to get to know themselves. Mm. Why? Because when you are a girl, you're already being told, this is how girls are. Sit like this. Don't sit like that. Be like this. Don't be like that. And so I think very, very quickly, we learn to define ourselves by other people. I am so-so-and-so's daughter. I am so-so-and-so's wife. I am so-so-and-so's sister. Right. Not to say that those are bad by no means, but you're an individual first. And I think that for many of us, we do not have the opportunity to actually get to understand ourselves. And in so doing, we understand what our strengths are, mm -hmm. what our skills are, what our interests are and how best we can then contribute to society. Mm -hmm. And so through Sisterhood Matters, what we are trying to do is give women and girls that opportunity to explore some of those questions. This year, we're focusing on women's health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And part of that well-being is how do you build relationships, whether business or personal? Mm -hmm. um, how do you take care of yourself? Because if you want to build a, com uh, a company or a country <coughs> and the bulk of your workforce is sick or dying prematurely because of lifestyle then diseases... Then you are out of luck. Thank you. Then you're running against time, yeah. essentially. So um, I think that's another element. It's, that's also part of the soft skills, just awareness of self um, and being able to identify these are my skill sets. I would have loved to be a doctor, mm -hmm. but the reality is if we're going to be realistic, that might not necessarily be where my skills lie. Mm -hmm. So either A, I'm going to take the time to build the skills, or B, I'm going to move into somewhere, um, to an area where my skills actually lie. Mm -hmm. And especially today, it's important to focus on transferable skills. So what do I mean by transferable skills? Communication is a transferable skill. Mm -hmm. You might not necessarily be a writer, but there is at least one form of communication that you gravitate towards and you find easy to do. If not writing, it could be speaking. If not speaking, it could actually be listening because mm -hmm. listening is also a communication skill, right? Um, so if you're able to identify some of these things and build upon them, then you would then have the chance to say, okay, career-wise, this is probably where I should be going. Wow, very, very, very solid, solid, solid points. And uh, this is the part of the show that I don't like very much when, <laughs> when it's almost time for us to say goodbye. Um, it's, it's been fantastic talking to you. I think for me, the five things I'm going to walk away from this conversation um, are that back to be curious. Yeah. Um, and uh, secondly, I think that you've demonstrated the passion required to give hope that 
all is not lost that no matter where you are you can start from that point to to but to the end that you're looking for number three is the importance of vision uh, that we, we we have to have a very concise idea of where we want to be uh, whether as individuals or as a nation there has to be a certain tangible uh, vision um, and then number four know yourself yeah. um, <laughs> not a lot of people um, you know do know themselves I don't know if I know myself very well I, all and I know it's always is that changing, I am, right? yes 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 just <laughs> before you, you you know when you think you've learned or then something else happens and then you discover something um, but um, the final thing though I, I find is that um, create the future that you're looking for um, and, and that comes in from um, you said it's important that we sculpt ourselves as we go along uh, and also craft your own opportunities. The things they're looking for are out there, but they're not going to come to you till you go looking for And them. also collaborate. Aha. Uh -huh. Also collaborate because the reality is no one person has it all. Mm -hmm. And um, this is how, if, for example, still going with, with Women's Month mm. theme, if women support each other, then there's more that we can achieve. Absolutely. Right. If by any miracle of God, we have the two main political parties actually coming together to work together for Ghana, then imagine what could happen. Yeah. Um, so collaborate and don't be restricted by the boxes or the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'm more as likely to work with another African from South Africa or Senegal mm -hmm. or Tunisia as I am from Ghana. Mm -hmm. The point is, if there's overlap in your visions and in the kind of work that you're doing, there's opportunity to work together. So it's also important for us to um, step away a bit from being so Ghana centric mm -hmm. to actually look at what's happening across Africa, because there's a lot happening. Mm -hmm. And many of us think Ghana is the end all be all. But. It's actually not the case. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jamila Abdullahi, uh, for making time to join us on the Executive Lounge. And uh, just a couple of notices. Um, so the weekends could only get better. Uh, relationship, family, fashion, lifestyle, health, uh, wellness, recipes, you name it, it's all in there. Uh, anything for dad, mom, big brother, little sister, kid bra. All your puzzles are in there, too. Remember to buy the Mirror this and every Saturday. Uh, that's the Mirror Ghana's most popular family weekend news platform. And also, um, if you are looking to um, scale up your startup, um, the Ghana Oracle Digital um, Enterprise Program is open. And um, you can call 0303. 978-396 to join uh, at the um, incubation. Um, you know, we're looking, they're looking for startups that they can help scale up. And uh, this is going to be launched in a couple of days. Uh, but if you do want to increase your own business potential, just call 0303-978-396. Or just go to my uh, social media handles. It's GH Rainmaker on all platforms. And you should be able to pick something up. So, I'm going to leave you with a song by uh, our favorite, uh, Wiala. Uh, and this is for you, Jamila. This is uh, Tinambayi, uh, which I think is a really good song. Enjoy. Have a good day. Go forward. Make rain. Shalom. Till next time.